Good morning and welcome to this UK IDC webinar on bridging the gap between employment law in the UK and India. My name is Adriana Vega. I'm Policy and Research Manager at the UK India Business Council and I will be your moderator today. Our speakers, Vandana Das from Davenport Solicitors and Rajneesh Singh from Simply HR, they will be sharing their insights into HR practices in the UK and in India. They will also discuss the importance of ensuring consistency in both countries and the areas where they are similar. Now, before we begin, I would like to familiarize you all with the toolbox on the right-hand side of your screen. Just to let you know, we will have everyone on mute during the course of the webinar to keep any background noise to a minimum. But if you do have any questions, please drop it into the little bracket on the toolbox to your right in the please type your question here box to send me your question, and I will take it up during the Q&A session at the end. For now, to make sure that, a, that you can all hear me clearly, could I please ask that you all use the raise your hand button on the toolbar. Again, could you please click the raise your hand button. Okay, thank you very much. I would now like to welcome Vandana and Rajneesh, who have prepared a thorough presentation on the topic of HR. Thank you, and over to you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Bantana Das um, from Davenport Solicitors. So today we're looking at HR employment law in the UK and India. Moving on to the next slide, we're going to look at the overview of employment law in the UK, followed by employment law and HR practices in India, which which Rajneesh will talk about, an overview of doing business in India, the so similarities between the two, and how to align your HR operations in India. We move to the next slide, and the next one. So, English law requires employers to provide their employees with a statement of terms, also called contract employment. It must contain certain information, such as the name of the employer, employee, place of work, salary, hours of work, paid leave entitlement, sickness, absence and pain entitlement, length of notice required to terminate employment, disciplinary and grievance procedures, provision for in pension and whether a collective agreement applies to the employment. We move to the next slide. So the employer has to provide these um, contract employments to the employee within two months starting employment. If they don't, they can be liable to a fine of between two and four weeks pay. Move to the next slide. Maximum working week annual leave entitlement. Most employees in the UK cannot be required to work more than an average of 48 hours a week unless they agree um, expressly in writing. Employees are entitled to 5.6 weeks paid annual leave and that can include public holidays and bank holidays. If the employee works on a part-time basis then this will be prorated. Move on to the next slide, please. Employees in the UK are entitled to statutory sick pay. There is, a, there is no statutory limit on the amount of time which employees may take off due to illness or injury. However, their entitlement to SSP ceases after they have been absent for sickness more than 28 weeks in any three-year period. The rate of SSP increases each year and is £87.55 a week for 2014-15 tax share. After one month's service, the employees are entitled to notice from their employer for termination of the employment. The minimum statutory right is one week's notice, and that rises by one week for each year of service, and that's a maximum of 12 weeks. Move to the next one. In terms of termination of employment, um, once employees have been employed for at least two years in most cases, they can only be dismissed for one of the five prescribed reasons. And this includes redundancy, incapability, misconduct, statutory restriction, and some other substantial reason. As well as having a fair reason for dismissal, the employers must also follow a fair procedure when dismissing an employee. If they fail to follow a fair procedure, or will terminate the employment for a reason other than one of the reasons are highlighted above. It can lead to a potential unfair dismissal claim. Moving on to the next slide. There are some cases where a dismissal is deemed automatically unfair, and in this instance, there is no qualifying period of service. 
which means that the employee is protected from the first day of, of their, their employment. Can you move to the next one? In the UK, employees are protected from discrimination. They have the right not to be discriminated against their age, disability, gender reassignment, marriage or civil partnership, pregnancy and maternity, race, religion or belief, sex or sexual orientation. And if, if, if an employee uh, brought a claim in the tribunal against the employer, the compensation for breach of the discrimination law is not subject to a cap. There's also a pension provision, and this is to encourage individual saving. Um, the government introduced new employer pension duties from the 1st of October 2012. These are being phased in for employers depending on the size of the workplace workforce over a five and a half year period, and it will eventually require all employers in the UK to automatically enrol eligible workers in a pension scheme. We'll move to the next slide. In terms of culture in the UK, Britain as a multicultural society has become increasingly diverse. It's accommodated large immigrant populations from India, Pakistan and the West Indies, and English is the most widely spoken language in the UK. Now moving, uh, moving on to which niche, you will cover the cultural issues in India. Uh, hello everyone, uh, this is Rajneesh uh, from Delhi, India. Uh, just to take you briefly through on the cultural issues in India, uh, broadly there are seven major religions and there are uh, many minor ones which exist in the country. As you would know, there we have close to 29 states uh, in the country, so we're quite diversified. Uh, each state represents a separate religion, uh, beliefs, having its own language and cultural uh, practices. Uh, in India, personal relationship building is, is, is very key to doing business. And, and people look forward to connecting, people look forward to building relationships. Uh, a caste system is something that, that has an impact, but it is, it is also fading away very soon, uh, very fast in fact. Uh, Indian employees, uh, by nature, the tendency is to be like a yes man. Uh, they would like to be instructed, they would like to kind of uh, follow instructions. Uh, at the same time, uh, with the influx of so many multinationals, there is also a culture of also expressing themselves, but we still remain quite kind of uh, following so-called orders. Uh, bureaucracy is very resistant to change, so the, at a very macro level, uh, as all of you would be following, India is, has a new government, and I think a lot of change is expected. Uh, one of the biggest things we struggle with is, is the level of poverty, which is still high uh, in the country. Over to the next slide, please. <coughs> Uh, some of the impact on culture, uh, uh, typically uh, you have, so we've got a large consumer base because of, of uh, being so highly populated. Uh, so their behavior kind of uh, uh, dictates how a product does in the country. Uh, being a large uh, consumer base, the local demand is very high for products. Uh, buying decisions uh, differ from state to state, uh, uh, from people who are well-off, income-wise, from people who are middle class, so the buying also depends on that. Uh, companies need to really build uh, uh, their brand in, in, in the market here in India so that people get attracted to their products. Uh, the nature of business also has an impact uh, on, on how a company is received in India. And of course, what kind of decisions the management of those companies carry out while they are operating in India also has an impact. Next slide, please. Next one, please. In terms of employment, uh, typically what Vandana also shared, uh, so there is once you have finalized a candidate in India, you will have a offer letter going to the individual which would broadly talk about the salary being offered, the kind of designation, the kind of grade that person is going to be in the company, uh, the kind of department you have hired him for and which location you have hired him for. And it also specifies with which is the joining date. Uh, in some companies, they also mention about the kind of leaves that, that, that are on offer in that company. Once the employee joins, uh, on, the, on day one of their joining, they are they're given an appointment letter. And the appointment letter is a much more detailed <coughs> document and which talks about the individual's entitlements and, and some basic company rules and also some guidelines of the organization as to how the company operates and what are the confidentiality thing clauses that an individual needs to sign up for. Next slide, please. After, so, so there is a, a once you join a company here, there is a probation period during which 
an employer, employer would like to see your performance, uh, your attitude towards work. Now this period could differ from company to company. It, it could go range from a month to three months to six months. So there is no law to it. Uh, it's a company policy. Uh, you decide your time, how much you would like to take in, in assessing somebody. Uh, based, of, based on this performance during the probation, a person is confirmed in the company. Uh, so that means till the time of six months or one month, three months, whatever is the clause, the person continues to be on probation till given a letter of confirmation. Next slide. Working hours, uh, so there are broadly two acts in the country which, which govern uh, the kind of organizations that set up business in India. One is an act called the Factories Act uh, 1948 which anyone coming into manufacturing kind of uh, needs to follow the clauses as per the Factories Act. Uh, if you are doing uh, trade or just uh, a service sector, setting up an office, a sales office or something, then a different act called Shops and Establishment Act is, is applied. As per the Factories Act, so if you are running a factory in India, you know, you, you get to employ somebody who has completed 18 years and as uh, the work week would be 48 hours, almost 6 days, 8 hours per day and not more than 9 hours in a day. And, and there are three types of leaves that generally get followed as per this act, which is earned leave, which is that you put in X number of days in a month and you earn one leave. Uh, sick leave is, is again kind of pre-designated, number of leaves around 7 leaves, 7 to 10 leaves is what you would see. Uh, towards sick leave and similarly 7 to 10 days towards casual leave. In all the entire leave would add up to almost like a 30 days which would be a month's, uh, a month's leave. Yeah, next slide please. <clears throat> so the Shops and Establishment Act gets applicable for people setting up just an office or you're just about doing some kind of trading. Uh, so again here very similar to the Factories Act, 48 hours uh, is, is the uh, work week. Um, any excess of more than that, overtime wages are also there. Overtime wages also apply to the factories as well. So both, again, the leave thing and again, Shopton Establishment Act is very similar to what exists in, in the Factories Act. Yeah, please. Next slide. Leave policy in India, uh, as per the Shops and Establishment Act, uh, slightly detailing it out. So privileged leave or you might call is an earned leave. Like I said, you work X number of days and, and you earn a day. And, and so every 20 days, for instance, you work 20 days, you earn one leave. Or that's, that's in, in other words, also called a privileged leave. Sickness leave is, is again, like I said, you are allotted a sickness, uh, uh, a bunch of uh, days, uh, 12 days is given. Uh, maternity leave is something that gets uh, um, a, a, a lady who is uh, pregnant, who is expecting a baby, so you get a... a 12 weeks uh, leave, which is 84 days uh, of leave, which is as per Act. So maternity Benefit Act is there in, in, as per the Indian uh, labor laws. Uh, over and above these leaves, there are close to 10 national holidays, which are broadly the festivals and some, you know, kind of a birthday of a, uh, Mahatma Gandhi. So some of those very important days uh, are Independence Day or Republic Day. So those are the, they add up to around 10 days. So Overall, between the leaves and these, these national holidays, close to 40 days goes towards leaves. Next slide, please. <clears throat> in, in the case of termination, uh, so uh, there are two kinds. I mean, one is where a voluntary resignation happens. The person wants to leave. He needs to serve the notice period, which the notice period, again, could depend on the level of, of that individual. If somebody is at a junior level in the organization, normally a one-month notice is supposed to be given to the employer. Somebody at a very senior level, uh, a three-month notice period is, is what is generally practiced. Uh, when the organization decides to exit the employee, so this is involuntary exit, then there could be reasons like non-performance, there could be integrity, there could be some sexual harassment cases, the gross misconduct could be there, or long unauthorized absenteeism could be there. All this uh, is, is mentioned in the appointment letter, so people do sign up for this. They are fully aware that if they conduct or they carry out some misconduct, they are liable to be terminated, post an inquiry uh, where the evidences need to be shared with the person and exactly told that this is what happened and this is the reason why he has been asked to go. Um, again, here also the notice period, so if it is a very grave misconduct, 
it could be a day's notice. I mean, you could just tell the person, here is your one month notice period pay, and you stop coming from tomorrow because this is a very serious integrity issue. Uh, there could be cases where you feel it's, it's more of a case of a redundancy. You can then allow that person to be in the company for X number of months, I mean, which could depend again on the company policy. And if, if the notice period says three months at a senior level, it could be three months as well. Next slide, please. Roles and responsibilities of HR, uh, like any other large organization globally, uh, these are the broad areas which, which companies focus in India as well. So there is a focus on talent acquisition, a lot of focus on employee relations. So uh, a lot of uh, uh, practices or processes are, are built around the HR discipline to be there in the company. Compensation benefits practices, again, uh, follows a typical, uh, the review, salary reviews are done once a year, which is, and, and the cycle that we follow for appraisals in most of the companies is April to March. Uh, so most of the salary increases if happen effective first April um, because that is the financial year that we follow. So most of the companies, they close their uh, financial books by March 31st. They see how they have performed and then accordingly they decide what kind of increments need to be done for people. Uh, compliance is the other big, big thing because we've got so many labor laws in the country. Again, the current government is trying to streamline things, make it simpler for people. So that is work in progress. And lastly, the whole uh, focus on learning and development, where again HR plays a very critical role. Next slide, please. On the talent acquisition, once you are here in India, there are two ways to look at people, uh, to find people. One is if you are looking for a lateral hire, an experienced resource. So there are uh, typically the company's websites are there. Uh, if you are particularly looking for uh, finding people in X type of companies, or you got the internet and social media which is fairly active. There are some uh, job portals which are very active. Uh, one of them very popular is called Nokri.com and Monster is anyway a global player so that also is fairly active in the country. Uh, you also have access to some recruiters, headhunters. Uh, there are some temp staffing agencies which have done uh, reasonably well in the recent years in the country. And of course the good old method of advertising in the newspaper also continues to be in the country. Um, on the other way of sourcing people would be if you're looking at fresh uh, students coming out of uh, colleges. So these could be technical institutes. Uh, these could be uh, B schools. Uh, so depending on the requirement, typically this is the time, right? From November to January is when the campus interviews happen in most of the colleges. And so the companies are right now carrying out their campus drives to look for talent. Next slide. So if you are here, business in India, let's look at what all needs to be done. So let next slide, please. <clears throat> so some of the type of ventures that you could be forming here. So one is, of course, clearly a, a private limited that gets formed. There is a joint venture possibility. There's, there are companies which are sole proprietorship. And then there are also companies off late uh, calling themselves as limited liability partnership firms. So these are the ways of forming ventures in, in the country. Next, please. The modes of business, very clearly, three of them. So either you will be in India manufacturing some products, uh, so you're going to set up a factory here. Uh, you could be trading, uh, which means you, you uh, manufacture something, but you export it all out. So that, that could be one way of doing business. And the third is to get into the service sector and then you are again setting up offices across the country and then carrying out your service uh, offerings. So those are the three modes of businesses that one could look at. Next slide, please. There are, once you come in, I, I think there are these, like I mentioned, the acts, very important that once you are getting into setting up a manufacturing thing to get uh, registered under, under the Factories Act becomes very, very important. Other two very important act which applies for the people working in those uh, companies, they employ state insurance, which is ESI, and provident fund. So ESI is a health care uh, act which, which provides for health care benefits for the employees, largely people working on the shop floor. And provident fund is something uh, more of a retiral benefit, uh, which you take benefit once you leave the organization. Trading would be largely either you are doing some kind of outsource work from here. So you could fall into Factories Act 
or you need to register as a Shops and Establishment Act. Again, the ASI and PF get applied. Uh, in the service sector, clearly a Shop and Establishment Act uh, coverage is, is must, so need to register under that. And then the usual ESI and PF registrations need to be done to when you're employing people. Next slide, please. Some of the other acts uh, uh, which, which I thought very briefly I'll touch upon. Apprentices Act provides you to hire uh, uh, people who are still carrying out their vocational training in the, in the school. So you can hire them from the schools for, uh, for a certain period of time. Uh, there is Contract Labor Act under which you can hire uh, contract labor uh, again uh, who, who could be sourced through uh, a typical temp agency or contract agency uh, but you need to again take a license as per this act to employ such contract employees. Uh, minimum wages act you need to uh, adhere to the kind of minimum wages that are applicable in the state so minimum wages differ from state to state and they get revised twice a year. Uh, Factories Act, like I said, uh, talks about various things, about working conditions, about the health, about leaves, about the work environment. And of course, Employees Provident Fund, like I said, 20 or more persons, if they are employed, you need to uh, get yourself registered under Provident Fund Act. Next slide, please. Over to you, Vandana. Okay, so no doubt there's some differences between the HR practices between UK and India. But there are also some similarities which um, we wanted to touch upon. So in both countries, complying with national employment legislation is vital. They both have procedures which employers have to follow. And if they don't, then they are found guilty as a tribunal or a court, an employer is likely to be ordered to pay compensation to the employee. Both, in both countries, employers sh should be providing a contract employment or an offer letter to their employees to set out the terms and conditions of their employment. Next slide, please. Employers need to ensure that the employees are paid national minimum wage. So in the UK, it's £6.50 per hour for anyone who's age 21 and over, £5.13 per hour if anyone's aged 18 to 21, and if there's an employee under the age of 18, it's £3.79 per hour, and apprentices um, usually get £2.73 pounds per hour. So in India, minimum wages do apply, but this is for blue-collar employees only. And it defers state to state and is revised twice a year. And there's probably three different categories of workers, which is skilled, semi-skilled, skilled, and unskilled. In both countries, training employees is vital to ensure increased productivity. And flexible working nowadays is becoming a much more preferred way of working. Move to the next slide, please. Staff manuals um, contain policies and procedures that the employer and the employee should follow. So although the staff manual is required in both countries, there are going to be different policies in, in, this, in, in each of the countries. Good HR practice is promoted to ensure employee satisfaction, which in turn hopefully will lead to increased productivity. And as I mentioned um, before, contracts and offer letters are extremely important. Just move into Rajesh? Yeah. Uh, very, very important. Like I said, uh, most of the companies in India, uh, whether they are Indian companies or multinationals which have set up business here, a lot of focus on, on uh, aligning themselves with the global practices, uh, which has helped companies um, minimize attrition uh, to raise the employee satisfaction, also have been getting branded as, as an employer of choice. Uh, it also differentiates company to company purely because of their uh, good HR practices. Uh, potentially, so if you're following the law of the land, uh, I think which, which is a very healthy practice to have, then, then you reduce the number of claims possibility. And it also ensures that you're globally uh, kind of consistent in your practices. Next slide. So very important, how do I align uh, HR operations in India? I think previous slide, can we go to the previous slide? Yeah. Ensure that you have the relevant contracts, policies and procedures in place. I think that is, so what we typically do for a lot of the companies is to set up the HR framework, which talks about, like Vandana mentioned about the manual, which consists of various policies, 
all relevant documents that need to be there, the kind of personal folders that you need to develop for each employee. Uh, it is important to know the difference between blue and white collar employees. The blue collar would typically be the person on the shop floor, uh, as, as, as we would otherwise call as workmen, working on the machines. And the white collar would be people in the supervisory or the managerial uh, category. Uh, check whether you have to pay national minimum wages, very important. Which state you are, what is the minimum wage existing there, it's very, very important that you follow, you build your wage structure around that. Uh, the difference between office and factory workers exists uh, uh, and, and uh, so the workers do get protected in many ways because uh, there are various acts which, which help them. Uh, so it becomes very, very important for the employer to abide by those uh, acts. Uh, apply your UKHR system in India, it's a good start, absolutely. I mean, uh, there could be some very similar practices would be, would, uh, which could be there and at the same time, there could be certain practices which are locally relevant in India and which could be uh, imbibed as well. Next slide. Important to seek uh, advice. I think whenever you are, uh, whenever one is, one is in a situation of dismissing employees for whatever gross mis indiscipline case, I think it's always good to seek advice as to how to go about it so that you minimize the claim risk. Uh, also need to really be maintaining a lot of uh, documents, evidence, etc. So that becomes very important for especially people whom you think are, are kind of turning out to be a habitual troublemaker kind of a, a person. Uh, need to maintain records, various records as per the uh, statutory requirements. Um, so towards leaves, towards holidays, mm -hmm. towards like I mentioned the other two important acts which is ESI and PF, they require a lot of records to be submitted to the government on a monthly basis. Uh, good practice to undertake appraisals, uh, monitor performance, everybody uh, like any other uh, country, uh, people appreciate that there is a, a proper performance appraisal existing in the system and that their KRAs are set up and that they are reviewed against the KRAs. Uh, probationary period, if employees performance is not satisfactory, if you want to give a fair opportunity to the individual, there is always a provision of extending uh, the probation period, but again, there needs to be a closure there so that, you know, you take a call whether you want an employee confirmed or not confirmed. Next slide, please. Yeah, questions, please. Yes, thank you very much to both our speakers for the very informative presentation. I'm now going to ask you a few questions that have been sent in by participants today. The first question is, what is the difference between a blue and white collar employee in India? Thank you, Adrina. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, the blue collar people are, are who are working on the machines on the shop floor. Uh, these would be coming largely with the education background of, of having done a course, uh, a technical course uh, from technical institutes which are called ITIs. And these ITIs uh, typically is a course that you do after your school. You learn the trade and that you get, then you get uh, apprenticeship opportunity in some companies. Once you are pass out from ITI, then you get employed in these companies. So you are, yes, in a sense you are called the blue collar in the country, but Increasingly, again, employers want to also uh, kind of uh, blur this line rather than have a very uh, demarcation kind of a thing. But yes, the act, the law still has a thing that there are certain acts for the workmen and they need to be protected. Uh, the white collar would be people who are supervisory in nature, who are managerial in nature. So those, those clearly, I mean, for them, it's largely the company policies that get applied and then whatever terms that you sign up during an appointment, those becomes applicable to you. Yeah. Great, thank, great. thank you very much for that, Rajneesh. The next question is, can the appraisals be the same as in India? Well, appraisals uh, could be, I mean, there could be very similar practices. Uh, one could also probably provision for some uh, local alignment, but broadly if you look at it, if any, any global company coming into India, the kind of uh, uh, work behavior, the kind of personal attributes they would like to measure would remain very similar. And, and so that, those elements in the appraisal reviews uh, remain very, very common. Uh, yes, probably the KRA setting could be slightly different in, in nature because the kind of work that you are doing 
the kind of uh, targets that you will set could differ. Uh, but but there could be a lot of common areas in the appraisal process uh, that you could be following in UK uh, as much as that you would want uh, uh, that to be practiced in India. It could require just a minor tweaking here and there, but I think it, it should be good to uh, do. Yes, please. Great. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, there's another question for you, Rashneesh. It says, um, Rashneesh mentioned Indian statutes from the 1940s. Do you expect the new government will yeah. pass new laws in this regard? Yes, so if someone has been following uh, the recent developments, uh, government has been making announcements. So a, a month back, there were some labor reforms which were announced. So the government is actively working on it. They want to simplify the process that rather than uh, you need to kind of uh, get uh, permission or get registration under various acts, you just apply at one single point and you get an approval for all the acts. So there are and a lot of things going on a, on a, a portal. They, they are also launching a portal which, through which you could uh, you, you simplify the process of getting registered. So there is a lot of work in progress. We have a lot of expectation. And I think rightfully pointed out that a lot of acts are still from the time of our uh, independence. Uh, but a lot of amendments keep happening. So if one really looks into a typical act, there will be a lot of amendments which happen which parliament keeps passing. So probably a, a amendment in the act could be as recent as last year. But the act per se remains an act dated or year of 1948. I mean, that's the way most of the acts would look like. But for instance, uh, sexual harassment work at the workplace. Uh, so for women employees, that act came in last year. So because there were many cases, and, we've, and the government felt that we need to have an act towards it. So parliament passed that, and now every company needs to have a sexual harassment policy. Great. Thank you for that. Another question is, do employees, do they need a certain length of service in order to bring claims against their employer? No, as such, there is nothing uh, uh, really that, that you need to put in X number of years uh, to, to make a claim. Um, you know, if, if a case, if somebody could be in six months joining, uh, some kind of a very bad case happens in your company, and, and if, it's, if it's badly handled, if we have not been fair in our approach in, in, in uh, doing the inquiry, so to say, or investigating the case, and if we end up paying for, for the mistakes we have committed, we get liable to pay. So as such, there is no number of years that you need to put into stake claim. Okay, thank you very much. There's another question here about, um, I'm just going to read it to you. It says, yes. um, the question is related to employment of expatriates by the Indian subsidiary of the parent company in the UK. And the question is, is PF contribution mandatory considering UK India does not have bilateral social security agreement? So PF would become, uh, 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 that's a very critical component. Um, and I, uh, I think it would, would, it would be important that one follows the law here. Um, and if it is an expat employee, if the local uh, compensation structure is built in a such a manner that the PF is also uh, covered, I think that would be a better practice. I mean, I, I would advise to do that. Okay, great. And I think we have one more question. It says, the UK has a two-month maximum limit on providing an employee a contract, otherwise the employer could be fined. Is there a similar uh, this, uh, deadline or penalty in India? No, nothing like that, Adriana. We don't have any such limit. Um, it purely depends between the company making the offer to the potential uh, employee and there is no time limit as such. So purely depends on both of them. Uh, when do they want to close it? When do they want to make the offer, sign up? And, and so purely depends on, on both the parties. Great. Um, any yeah. questions keep coming so, in. So, sorry, yeah, oh, I would mention. Sorry, Martin, if you want to add that, to that, it's fine. Yeah, I just wanted to mention in terms of the two months, and um, if the employer can be liable to a fine, if the employee brings a claim against them for failure to provide a, a contract employment, and saying that it isn't a standalone claim. You, 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 usually, you have to bring another claim, such as unfair dismissal, in order to tack that particular claim on. 
Okay, um, there's a follow-up question on this PF issue, um, and it says, can the PF be withdrawn when the expat leaves employment before attaining 50, 58 years of age? And is there TDS if he leaves before five years? Well, that, that's a very, very technical question, uh, <laughs> but, an interesting, but an interesting one. Uh, you know, so I, the withdrawal is absolutely possible. I mean, what the clause which in PF applies is that for the next 60 days, if you can prove that you are unemployed after leaving my company, uh, then if you are able to uh, give a documentary proof for, for 60 days you are not employed, then there is a provision for withdrawing that money. I mean, there is a process for that. You apply for it and the money comes to you. So clearly there is a withdrawal process. You can do it. Most of the employees within the country would typically transfer that money to the next company. And that's a very good process because people, because it's a retiral benefit, so people would want to move the amount to the, to the next, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the PF office. Uh, mm -hmm. Largely what has been also happening at the government level is that can we simplify the PF process? I mean, right now you get a, a PF number and, and, and it keeps changing from a state to state. So what is being attempted is that can we have a unique number which is a national number? And then even if I move from one company to another company, I shouldn't be getting a different number. So that unique number is, is what, what is being worked out by the government. I think that should be an interesting move because that would again simplify lives for people. So you have both the options. You can transfer. If you are carrying on an employment after leaving a company, you can also withdraw after 60 days of, of really proving that you have not been working anywhere. You can jolly well uh, uh, take a, a withdraw the money from here. On the, on the tedious thing, I think it's, it's a bit of a technical question. Probably I'll, I'll park it for the moment. Uh, that, that I would like to actually go through and understand that. But it's yes, a good no question. problem. No problem. Yeah. I, I, we're going to share your contact details at the end, um, yes. just so that the participants can get in touch with you directly. And if Thank I can you. just ask one final question for for the webinar, it, I know it's, it will sound very broad, but just if you could give us a sense, um, the question relates to different states' regulation uh, and and just roughly how are they different in different states versus the national employment law. So you know, labor labor is a, a so-called a concurrent uh, uh, thing in India in the sense that it is also managed by the central government as much as it is also managed by the state governments. So while there are broad acts which are there, but some of the clauses might keep keep differing from state to state, and not major differences. Honest, I mean, these differences will not be major ones. So there are certain states which might practice a X type of a clause in, in, in their state. But broadly, it, it, it's not very different. I mean, like, for instance, a provident fund, you know, it, it's very similar. I mean, the kind of money that needs to be getting deducted from your salary towards provident fund contribution is, is a national thing. I mean, it just doesn't differ from state to state. Or employee state insurance, it's a health care, it's a national thing, it doesn't differ. So the only difference in, in act would be some of the clauses. I mean, not major, I would say, changes, uh, differences are there. Great. Thank you very much, Rajneesh and Bandana, for that very informative um, session and, and the question and answer session. So just to wrap up for today, I want to thank you very much for your time, and I hope this webinar was valuable to all the people that joined us today. If you have any feedback or comments about today's session or a session that you'd like to see us do in the future, please feel free to get in touch. Also, if you have any inquiries on accessing, accessing India, uh, the UKIBC is here to help. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.